Genesis chapter 1. Let's turn in our Bibles there. I appreciate you being here. And um, we're going through the, the creation week. And um, it, it's been a while since we uh, were here on a Sunday night. Sunday, last Sunday night was my fault. Sunday night before that, we were in camp. And uh, so anyway, so I'm going to kind of go back over some things very quickly, look at the creation week and, and just sort of how, how God says everything. Um, the theme tonight, I, I know we, the last time we were here, we started on day five, but I, I don't know, I, I just, I look back and, and I felt convicted because there were some things that I wanted to, to kind of go back over on the fourth day of creation pertaining to light. And um, so I, I figured, you know, well, maybe I'll back up a little bit and, and cover some of the things that I, I just really feel like God wanted me to say. And I'm going to do that tonight. And the theme of it is there's been something in my heart all day long today. And uh, some people have, have messaged me over the message this morning. And it was, it was positive. Nobody tuned me out or anything like that. But uh, I just, I have it in my mind. I really, I really think this way. I really believe this way. Um, we're going we're gonna to end up in Matthew 13. We're going to deal with the parable of the wheat and the tares. And let me tell you where I'm, where I'm thinking. I think the tares are starting to turn ripe. I think all the fake... Christians who look, who tried to look like they were really right up there with God. I think we're in such a day now as that God is literally separating out the wheat from the tear. I think it's starting to become a little bit clearer who is saved and who isn't. And it's, it's, it doesn't take a genius to figure these things out. I mean, I can tell the difference. Liam. Liam's six years old. How does it feel to be six? It's awesome, isn't it? Liam, could you be able to tell me the difference? If I were holding an apple and an orange up here, would you be able to tell the difference between an apple and an orange? You know what an apple is, right? You know what an orange is, right? And they're not the same thing, right? So at six years old, Liam is able to see the difference between an apple and an orange. It's that simple now. It really is. Uh, Sister Betty, you blessed my heart today telling me what you told me after Sunday school. Can I talk about that for a minute, here in a minute? All right. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell something on her. I, I, she, I wanted to just do cartwheels all through the church. I'm glad I didn't, but I wanted to. It made me happy. Let's read, um, start in verse 14 in Genesis 1. And God said. And this is really the, the, the important part of the whole chapter. If God says it, it happens. And if God doesn't say it, it doesn't happen. And if God says it, there isn't anything in the world that can stop it from happening. If God says it, that's it. So God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. There's four things here. That number always sticks out to me. This is day four of creation. And there are no accidents with God. He does everything for a reason. He does things in order. This is how we know it's God. And of course, that number represents the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So there's something pertaining to the gospel, salvation of men's souls, and light, and the difference between day and night. Liam, you're six years old. Look outside and tell me whether it's day or night. Okay. See, he knows the difference. It's that simple. It really is that simple. Let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. See? If God says it, it happens. 
And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Something just popped into my mind as I'm going back over verse 16. Is that when the greater light that rules over the day, of course, is the sun. And the sun itself does not have what the moon has. The moon comes and goes in stages. So even the lesser light that rules over the night, which is the moon, there are days when you can't see the moon. I mean, it's, it's there, but you cannot see it. It is complete darkness to us. Not so with the sun. The sun, when it comes up, is always bright. It's always hot. It's always warm. It is consistent every single day. The moon isn't that way. And there's a lesson in that, that we're children of the day and not children of the night. And I'm going to get into that as, as we go on. Father, pray your blessing be upon your word tonight. I appreciate those that have come to be with us, those that are with us online. And I pray, God, that you would just give a blessing to each and every one. Father, fill our hearts with knowledge and give us understanding of, of your word. And by that, give us understanding of the world around us and help us to see, Father, that uh, this world is turning out exactly the way the scriptures said it would exactly the way that your word prophesied and father there's so many things god that we can see going on now that is exactly thus saith the lord so i pray dear god that you lighten our minds and our hearts and and establish us father in truth and i pray dear god that you would open up our minds and our hearts i pray lord that you'd bless those that are listening in, those that may be watching this a little bit later on throughout the week. And Father, let light shine in someone's heart tonight. We pray, Lord, that you just visit with us now and fellowship with us and help us to love you and to love one another as we love your word. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, I have up on the screen Revelation twenty two sixteen. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you of these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and the morning star and i i lit, i believe that this is not the planet venus that he's talking about i believe he's talking about the sun he is uh the day star that rises in our hearts and that day star of course is represented as the sun so what i i'm going to kind of put it out to you tonight I was, this is this is um test the church night yeah the lights just came on while i'm talking isn't that amazing it's the glory of God shining down on me. But I want you to think in the Bible now of places where God or the Bible teaches us that Jesus is like the sun that's up in the sky. Go. Give me some verses. That was for you. Okay, you're all nodding your head going, amen. No, I want you to show me in the Bible where Jesus is like the sun. Okay, who can help me out here? That's okay, you can, you, can use the, you can use the tools that we have given you. Bible search software, whether you use ours or somebody else's, doesn't matter to me. Alicia, go! Hold on, hold on. Everybody turn to Malachi chapter 4. Verse 2, Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son, notice that it's capitalized, S-U-N, the the translators knew who that was talking about. It was talking about Jesus. He is the son of righteousness. 
But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Look at verse 3. And you shall tread down the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this. Saith the Lord of hosts. Now you ponder that for a minute. Because right now we're living in the age of grace. There's no doubt in my mind about it. That God's grace is, is he's trying to manifest his love. For mankind is creation. He's trying to show the world that he really does love them and that he'll forgive every one of their sins freely. But most people are not going to accept that. And I think now, you know, I'm praying for revival, but down deep in my heart, I really think God is saying, I'm going to let the wickedness grow. I'm going to let the wickedness grow of this world be manifested and I'm gonna bring the, I'm gonna bring the course of this world to a time when it's going to be very clearly seen who is right with God and who isn't right with God I think I think God's allowing that to take place you may agree you may not agree but I think with what we're seeing now, you know, my mind, I cannot get away from the fact that all around the country, everywhere in this country today, and I think they pick Sunday deliberately, everywhere around the country, there are gay pride parades in most major cities in this country today. And I can't get away from that. I can't ignore that. To me, and I said this this morning, they are snubbing their noses at God. They're telling God, we hate you, we hate your word, we don't want your love, we don't want your grace, we don't want your forgiveness. What we want is to be allowed to sin without any consequences whatsoever. And I think God is saying, if that's what you want, that's what I'm going to give you. Okay? So, unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness rise. So what that, what that means is, is that be, if you love and fear God, he will give you the light in, of your life necessary to show you the path that you're to walk on, to show you the sins that you have committed, to show you that God loves you and that God wants to forgive you and to show you the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what that means. But those who don't fear his name, they're going to end up being ashes under the sole of our feet. Now you think about that. That means God's going to send the wrath and the fire of his wrath down on this earth and consume mankind is what that means. So that's good. Who's got another one? That was one. There's more than one. Joshua 10, 12. Now I know Joshua 10. So let's see here. Jeff, then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. Okay, help me out here. Jesus, this, you're saying this shows that Jesus is the Son, the greater light to rule today, right? Okay, help me out with that. How does... Huh? Okay, well, okay. Capital S. My thinking was they capitalized it because it's the beginning of the statement that they're being grammatically correct here. But it could have something to do with it. Who else? Melissa. Revelation 21, what? 23, turn there. Revelation 21, 23. You know, if nothing else, you're turning, you're reading the Bible. Revelation 21, 23. Oh, yeah, look at that. Revelation 21, 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Somebody say amen. And that's, that's a good one. That's it. Because... When, here, here we're on day four, and God is putting the sun and the moon and the stars, but he's already created light and put light upon the earth. 
And we know it had to be real light because on day three, he planted seeds and trees and grass and everything that has leaves on day three. And we know that everything that has leaves needs light because it converts light into food. It's called photosynthesis. We learned this when we were in third grade or fourth grade, right? Photosynthesis, right? Because it turns the light into food, right? So you learned that. Okay, so that's, a, that's another good one. Who's got another one? Sweetie pie. Revelation 10. Oh, listen. My wife knows me. That's one of my favorite places in the whole. I love Revelation 10. My thinking is that Revelation 10, I can't get away from thinking that this is Jesus. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud. And the Bible said Jesus is coming in the clouds. Uh, and a rainbow was upon his head. If you look in Ezekiel 1, the rainbow was the glory of the Lord. And God said, my glory will I not give to any other. So... I, I just, it, and then it says, and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. Now we see in Revelation 5 that Jesus was the one who was able to go to the father, take the book out of his hand and loose the seals and open the book. So if Jesus is the only one who was worthy to open the book, then it stands to reason here we have the one whose face shines like a sun and he's holding the book in his hand and it's opened. So I think, Ron, that that would be Jesus. He's the angel of the Lord all through the Old Testament. He is the angel, capital A angel, that God told Moses would lead Israel, would finish leading Israel into the promised land. So that's, that's my thing, and, and there's a lot in Revelation 10 that I could talk about tonight, but I'd, I'd want to stick with the subject. This is good. Who else got one? Yes. Oh, yeah. You're, you're getting into my notes now. Revelation 1. And I, I actually touched on this when I showed you. Let's see if I can find it here. Yeah. Right here. From the perspective of the earth, the sun is surrounded by the seven planets. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus. And I'm pronouncing it that way for a reason. And then Neptune. And when Revelation 1 was written, nobody knew about what was beyond Saturn because they couldn't see it. Uranus and Neptune are planets that cannot be seen without a telescope. But they've been there all this time. And so in Revelation 1, what verse was it? 16. Let's start back in verse 12. I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about with paps with a golden girdle. And his head and his hairs were white like wool, white as snow. I love that. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. I love that. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So here is Jesus, and he is in the midst of seven stars, and here is the sun in the midst of the seven planets from the perspective of the earth. And I think John just described to you the way the solar system, system is set up. No, and Jesus knew that and he inspired John to write that down and that was knowledge that was not known in the days of John. Nobody knew that the solar system was actually that way, that it was the sun surrounded by the seven stars from the perspective of the earth. No one knew that. Well, anyway, what does this all mean? Um, 
John chapter 8. Turn there. I've got a few verses there on the screen. John chapter 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I'm the light of the world. So the Son then represents Christ. He is the Son of righteousness who arises in, uh, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but anyway, He is the Son. Capital S-U-N. He's the light of the world. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And I want you to ponder this, because everybody, everybody that has rejected the Word of God, and when you know me, when I say Word of God, I don't just mean any Bible anywhere. I mean this Bible. When the churches reject this Bible, they walk in darkness, which is why, Ron, that the churches are now supporting the LGBTQRLLGGBBTTQQ. Why would they do that? Because the churches then walk in darkness. Because they have rejected the light of Jesus Christ and His Word. I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 9, 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. As long as, hey, as long as you are here and you believe the word of God, the light of the world is still here. But think about what he's going to do. One of these days, Jesus is going to sound a trumpet, there's going to be a shout, and we're leaving. And I think that when we leave, this world's going to be plunged into darkness. That's when the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth everything about God. Matthew, now look at Matthew 5.14. Look at, compare these verses. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. By the way, in, when, I, when I study the history of America, and I go back and look at what men like Jonathan Winthrop and those men who left Europe, left England, sailed across to establish colonies in the Americas. They saw themselves in the light of Scripture. They, they saw themselves like Israel. They said, we are the people that God has set aside for himself who cr have crossed the sea and come to a land flowing with milk and honey. And they literally saw themselves as God led Israel across the sea to, to the promised land. They said God has led us to this land to be a city set on a hill. They literally said that about themselves. And I believe them. I believe them. Because you think about it. Once Christianity was established in America, and America grew, missionaries went out of America literally to the four corners of the earth spreading the gospel everywhere. Historical fact. That the denominations, even though they may have been birthed in various times in Europe, when they came to America, they found fertile ground. And I mean, they grew. And as they grew, each denomination, that got, and God was using them because they were all following the word of God. They all took and they went out and they had missionary efforts all over the world. Okay? So I believe that. But... I think the sun's going down. I think the sun's going down, people. And I think the Gentile world has probably said to God, God, we've had enough of you. I think that day's coming. Definitely on days like this, when you've got hundreds of thousands, of, you, you have millions of people all over the world telling God, we don't want you anymore. And all God ever did was love them. Amen? Job 33, verse 29. Lo, all these things worth it God oftentimes with man to bring his soul back from the pit to be enlightened 
with the light of the living. That's like we was talking about a while ago, trees, grass and trees need sunlight. Your garden, Courtney, Todd, your garden, you didn't plant it down by the woods because the woods will cover it up. You planted it out so to get sunlight. And when he says to be enlightened with the light of the living, that's, that's one of the things I see in that. Is that everything that grows needs sunlight to live. We need roots and we need sunlight. And think about what Jesus taught when he was teaching the parable of, of, the, of the seed and the sower. That what happens in a person's life, yes, the word of God goes to them, but it gets choked out. By the thorns that are in their life. It gets, the word of God gets choked out and it doesn't get any sunlight. And because of that, it doesn't build roots. And it will not produce fruit. It will vanish away. And I've seen it happen dozens of times. Maybe even more than that. Psalm 4 verse 6. There be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. Think about what we just saw in Revelation 1, that, that verse that Lisa brought up about Jesus and his countenance was shining as the sun. And he says, let the, let the light of thy countenance, you know, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Let Jesus shine on your life. Let the word of God shine on your life to show you the way to go, show, to show you the way to live, to show you that what they're doing in the world, young people, listen, what everybody else is doing in the world is wrong. Don't follow them. Young people, listen to me on families watching us online. Don't follow the world. They've shut out the light of God out of their lives and they're, they're walking in darkness. Don't follow after them. Please don't follow after them. Psalm 44 verse 3. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword. You think about that. And, and I read this morning, George Washington and those men who signed the Declaration of Independence said, if we don't have God on our side, we're going to lose this thing. And they recognized that this land was not won by the military prowess of America. It was won by the grace of God. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them, but by thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst a favor unto them. Now, who in here believes the Bible? Raise your hand. Simple question, right? You believe the Bible. That's a gift given to you by God. The fact that you believe the Bible. I mean, look, at, look back there. But thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst a favor unto them. God favored you enough to let you believe the Bible to begin with. And you know my testimony. For God to even show up to me that day to tell me, Mike, you know that Bible's right and everything it says. That was grace. Nothing else but grace. Because God could have turned me over. To a reprobate mind but he didn't he gave me grace said Mike you can believe everything that this book says and from that point I did I believed it I believe every word of it I don't care what the scientists say I don't care what the government says I don't care what the sodomites say I don't care what anybody says this world was created in six days six thousand years ago exactly the way the Bible says it was and yes, God created light one day and then four days later puts the sun, moon, and the stars up in the heavens. That is exactly how God did it. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what the telescopes, they say, well, we can see this and this. I don't care. I believe what God says. Amen. That's the blessing of the light of God shining on you. Psalm 89, 15, blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. Because Jesus' face shines as the sun. Psalm 90, verse 8, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. Look at what God's telling, telling you. God confronted you about your sins. Did he not? God shone a light on you. He said, let there be night. Now look at your life. Look at what you're doing. What you're doing's wrong. And you repented of that. That was the gift of God. Proverbs 16, 15, In the light of the king's countenance is life. And his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. 
John 1, 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. John eleven nine. 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. Twelve hours in the day. Why that number? In, in fact, in the northern hemisphere, which is where we live, there's actually only two days where there's 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. What are they? No, just the opposite. The spring and fall equinox. Equal, equinox. March 21st, September 21st, 12 hours in the day. In those two days. But the number 12 represents God's promise. Think about Genesis 12, God made a promise to Abram. He said, I'll bless you, bless them that bless you, and curse them that curse you. And out of thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And it was a promise concerning Jesus. So then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob has the 12 tribes. The New Testament now, the promise is represented by the 12 disciples, 12 apostles. So in the book of Revelation, we see that new Jerusalem, and it has 12 gates, and it has the foundation of the 12 apostles, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So that is a fulfillment of God's promise. The promise that God has given us is that one day we get to live in a land that's ruled over, not by the rich, not by the powerful, not by the wealthy, not by evil people. It's ruled over by God himself. Won't that be a blessing? Somebody say amen. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Remember, it's, it's about the face of Christ. He is the Son. His face in Matthew, tw Matthew, it's Matthew 17. Matthew 17, Jesus goes up the Mount of Transfiguration. He comes back down, His face shining as the sun. Revelation 21, 24, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor to it. Revelation 22, 5, And there shall be no night there, and they, know, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Turn to um, 1 Thessalonians 5, and then we're going to go to Matthew 13. Yeah, 1 Thessalonians 5. Mm -mm -mm. Job 18, 5. Yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. The light shall be dark in his tabernacle, and his candle shall be put out with him. I'm going to give you a little theory. Everybody's DNA. Everybody is made of DNA. And your DNA is made of two things. Your two basic compounds. Phosphorus and sugar. And DNA is a book that God wrote. The phosphorus part means that it's a book of light. And it gives life to everything that lives. And I think that people who take the mark of the beast I think it alters them genetically and I think that somehow some way it changes their DNA so that it's no longer based upon phosphorus light but something else that doesn't give light I think literally God takes their candle out and puts out the light that is in them. Right now, everybody in this world, as far as I know, has the opportunity to be saved. Everybody is a candidate for salvation. But I think when that mark comes, literally God cuts them off, turns them over to complete darkness. Complete darkness. At that point, no chance for redemption whatsoever. No chance whatsoever. Romans 2, 17, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and, yet, and are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. 
2 Corinthians, the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, look at this. And the God of the world, God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So these people marching today, Satan has blinded them. All of us used to be like that at one time. Did we not? Were we not blinded? By Satan, by the God of this world. But then God said to us, let there be light. And then we saw the light of God. We saw the word of God. We believed what God said. That was a gift given to us by God himself when he shined that light on us. Those people, for, I, I'm assuming that probably most of those people, if not all of them, marching today in that Sodomite parade, have said to God numerous times, I don't want you. I hate you. I hate everything about God. I hate Jesus Christ. They hide, they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. And I think at some point God says to a man, I'm done with you. And turns off the light. And at that point, God has turned them over to a reprobate mind. They're never, they are never going to get saved. You think about people that God turns over. He exposes who they are. It, it becomes known then what fruit they've been bearing all along. They've been trying to hide it and pretend. Here's an orange tree trying to pretend it's an apple tree. But then the fruit comes out and you find out it wasn't an apple tree, it was an orange tree. Okay? And I've got an illustration in the back of my mind. I may share it with you. I don't know. It's pretty wicked, but I might do that. Now, 2 Thessalonians 5. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But, and here's the difference now. We don't need to worry about that day. We don't need to worry about it. Number one, God gives us this day and he tells us, Jesus tells us, don't think about tomorrow. Don't sit and fret over tomorrow. You, I gave you today. Deal with today. Work, work on today. All right? Tomorrow's comes and when tomorrow comes, what's going to happen is going to happen. So he, we're children of the day. We're not of the darkness. So that day is not going to overtake us as a thief. We'll know it's coming. I think we will. Ye brethren, verse 4, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light and children of the day. So this is why Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then he says, ye are the light of the world. Because... He is in us, and we are in Him, simultaneously. I don't understand it completely, but I believe it. So that's why He said both. We are the light of the world, and He's the light of the world, because we're children of the day. So if the Son has a Son, the Son of the Son is a... Thank you, John. John got it. The son of the son is a son. Amen? So, you're children of the day. And the children, we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, verse 6, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be what? Sober. Those people up there have drank the vine of Sodom and they're drunk and they're mad. It means they're crazy headed. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. I have hope that when that day comes, I'll still be shining like the sun. Now turn to Matthew uh, 13. Matthew 13. This has been on my heart all day. And I cannot, I can't get away from it. 
Matthew 13, there's various parables here about that deal with seed, actually. We know the seed is the Word of God. And now we're living in a day where a, a plant's DNA can be rewritten. And it can be done easily now. If you've heard of CRISPR... DNA editing, you don't need to understand how it works, but it's a very simple process. In fact, it's so simple and so accurate, they'll sell you kits. You can buy kits over the internet. High school kids can purchase a kit for about $35 and rewrite the genetics of some sort of little simple bacteria. So they're sitting in their room next to their Iron Man poster rewriting DNA altering the genetics of some sort of species. That's how easy it is now to do this. Before they realized what CRISPR could do, it was very difficult and it didn't work very well to change the DNA of something. Now they figured out how to do it. They're actually using nature to do it. They figured out how easy it is and how accurate it is. Now, science is exploding with, let's rewrite this DNA, let's rewrite that DNA, see what happens. Let's recreate this, let's redo this. Let's change the genetics of mankind. Let's alter man so that man is no longer man. He's a different species altogether, okay? And, and that's what's being done right now. So all this parable about seed in Matthew 13, I think is very relevant for today because... I was born of Milton Don and Julia Ann Hoggard. I have their DNA. And to me, that DNA is not up for alteration. I'll tell you that right now. If the word that goes into you is corrupt, can it produce good fruit? No. No. If the word that's seeded into you is incorrupt, is it possible that it can produce corrupt fruit? No. Same answer, no. So there's a lot of teaching here in this, but I want to look at verse um, 24. Matthew 13. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sowed good seed in his field. And we learned from the previous uh, previous parable that the seed is the Bible. It's the words that God said. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. The enemy we know is Satan. When the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So, and I've, used, I've done this several times. I have a teaching on it. And I just kind of did some study on what tares were. They're, they're poison darnels and is the common name for it. And when they are growing next to wheat, or let's say in a wheat field, while both are green, it's not easy to tell them apart. And I want you to really think about this for a minute. Because for years... The seeds, I mean, you guys come here, I love you guys. You guys come here because your church and our church use the same Bible. Is that right? NIV, right? No. King James. So that makes us brethren. God's our father. We have his DNA in us. So that good seed, and Jesus explains it, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. Their church, our church, other churches that we know, there's good churches still all around the world preaching this old King James Bible and not going to let go of it either, ever. Okay? But then, 1973... It actually started back in the 1800s, but we'll start with 1973. 1973, Zondervan published the New International Version of the Bible. And it was slow to take off. Churches 
people started buying it and they sold it as it's just a modern interpretation of the Bible. There's really not any difference. All the Bibles are the same. But people started looking at it and some of the people were going, uh, there's a difference here. There's a big difference. There are verses missing. There are things missing out of the NIV that were in our King James. And to some people, some people said, well, this, the change is not significant enough to really make a difference. Anybody who reads these new Bibles, they're just as saved as everybody else is. And in the early years, you couldn't tell, really, that there was such a big deal, that it wasn't making a difference. But that was in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. Now we're nearing 2020. We're well into the 21st century. We're well into, what, 30, 50? It'll be almost in 2023, it'll be 50 years that the NIV has been out. And then after the NIV, you had the New American Standard, you had the Revised, you had the New English Version, you had, and it just one version after another coming out. Early on, you may not have been able to see the difference. But now, now we can see the difference. And I'm going to tell you something. I get contacted by a lot of people throughout the week. They're all telling me the same thing. And, I, and we're experiencing it here in this church. And I know of other churches that are going through this. They're finding out that family members that they had that they thought were saved, they're turning. They're supporting sodomites. They're supporting all these liberal agendas everywhere. And they're finding out that the family members that they had, the division back 20, 30 years ago was small and now the division is huge. And we're talking not just brothers and sisters and cousins, we're talking about husbands and wives. Boom, two different directions. And here's what's happening. As the wheat and the tares grow together, if you look at Um, verse 39 of Matthew 13, or verse 38. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Children, offspring, genetics, DNA. Wheat is not tare, and tare is not wheat. They're not the same thing. Wolves in sheep's clothing are not sheep. They're wolves. It's a different genetics, different DNA. Verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As the tares there, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Verse 41, the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. See, he's telling you who the tares are. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as what? The sun. Here's what's going on, and you mark this down, because you're going to see more of it, not less. You're going to see more and more marriages, more and more families, more and more churches, more and more people who said they were saved, said they were Christians, said they were right with God. You're going to see what happens is at harvest, there's a transformation takes place, and the wheat it's not green anymore. It turns golden yellow like the sun. The poison darnel doesn't. It turns black as the ace of spades. I'm not kidding you. Look at, do a Google image search and type in poison darnel, and it, they are black. You can clearly tell. So they're sending reapers out, right? The reapers are going, that's wheat, that's tares. That's wheat, that's tares. They can see the difference now, can't they? This is, what's, this is our world right now. We're seeing 
who the weed are and who the tares are. You're going to see more of it, not less. You're going to see people that you thought were solid that are not. They were fake. They were putting on a show. I have a, a minister that I personally knew and admired him. Said he stood for, he preached out of a King James, solid as a summer day is long, preached righteousness, preached holiness, preached against sin. They caught him at the hotel with his mistress. And when confronted about his sin, Sandy, he chose his mistress over Jesus Christ. Fake as a three dollar bill. That hurt me. That scared me. That makes you go to the cross and say, God, make me right with you. Don't, and don't, don't turn me over to that. Uh, Tracy, lady out in Indiana, sent me a, a Twitter feed about one of these guys that makes all these videos. He's... He's supposedly this Christian guy that makes all these flat earth videos, Todd. And he, he call, he's like this flat earth evangelist. I'm here to show everybody that the Bible says the earth is really flat. So he's been pushing this on people for quite a while, making a big noise on YouTube. They busted him. They got 56 counts of child pornography against the guy. He's in jail right now. Where he should be. They busted him hard. God at some time turned this man over. I'm telling you. We're going to see more of that. Not less. Look around you. How many, how many people are sitting here? We're going to see more of it. Not less. We're going to see people that we've been, we thought maybe they were right, maybe, they, maybe they're okay. You're going to see a change in people. Because the fruit, the seed that's in them is always going to manifest itself. And when it manifests itself, it is going to be of the utmost wickedness that you can imagine. It scares me. When I think that even in this group, in this group here, who is a tear? Who is a tear? It's, I don't, I'm not, I'm not judging. It's not for me to judge. There's no way I could. But I'm telling you what's going to happen. At some point, that wicked, corrupt seed that's in you, it's going to be manifested. And then everybody's going to know who you are. Amen? If you're a child of the day, you are not a child of darkness. And if you're a child of darkness, you are not a child of the day. You cannot mix the two. Boy, I, I could go on this for another hour. But I'm telling you, we're going to see more of the manifestation of both the wheat and the tares. As days go on, more, don't be alarmed at the manifestation of evil that's in people. Don't be alarmed at it because you were told in the Bible that it was going to happen. You read this Bible and you'll find out what I'm talking about. You're going to find there's so much wickedness in people right now. It's just laying there, but it's going to bust out one of these days. And then it's going to be known. Okay? I was playing a song before church started. A song we were going to try to sing this morning, but I decided to kind of hurry the service along for time. But it was called, Is Thy Heart Right With God? And I'm going to ask everybody tonight, and I mean everybody we're going to close in prayer. And I want you to bow your head. And I want you to ask God. God, is my heart right? 
Because it may be that you're just a tear among wheat. I'd hate to see that happen to anybody. Anybody that's in this room right now, I love you. And I hope it doesn't turn out that way. Because I've already seen so much of it. It's disheartening.